Here's Chief Marshal Tyagi, uh, Marshal Chopra. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Chair, uh, for the kind words. Uh, I am going to speak on uh, impact of technology on air warfare. You know, it, I find it challenging to do that because when two eminent speakers uh, have said that don't be seduced by the technology, I am not suggesting seduction. I am proposing marriage with technology. <laughs> uh, and Triple R, just to uh, say on that, I believe even the theme of Command, Command Commanders Conference was RRR, Ready, Resurgent and Resilient. <clears throat> well, uh, talking about the impact of technology, uh, I will speak specifically on some of the emerging technologies on air warfare. Technology is not new to air warfare, and air, for, uh, air warfare itself is a form of technology. However, there is a distinction when we stand at the intersection of legacy technology, national security, and emerging technologies. The distinction is that unlike nuclear weapons, stealth, or precision capability that proliferated slowly, the emerging technologies that we are going to discuss will spread quickly. Another distinction is that emerging technologies will see an increasing number of private players who are unconcerned about collaterals making control and vulnerability an issue. The relationship between quality and quantity is constantly changing as a result of technological advancements. While precision weapons reduce the number of aircraft over the target, low-cost swarms have brought mass back to the airfield. In 2018, the tech company Intel flew 2018 drones at once in Folsom, California. They were participating in a light show, hence carrying lights, but could well carry ammunition instead. Now, is it strategy that drives technology or technology that drives strategy? Analysts argue that technology is merely an enabler, and what matters is how strategists use it. In my opinion, it is contextual. The status of technology is determined by the nature of warfare, that is, have the fundamentals of war changed? For example, if another Pulwama occurs tomorrow, will retaliation take the form of targeting a military or terrorist installation, or will it take the form of electronically targeting their banking sector or power grid? In any war, the primary goal would still be to win the war as soon as possible. There will be no absolute uh, substitute for targets, physical destruction, in my opinion, for quite some time. The ongoing conflict is a testimony to that. If that be so, then any technology that does not ultimately help in addressing the target of choice and in quick time is of not much use. Technology is needed to reduce the adversary's decision-making time and aid you in quick decision-making. Consider hypersonic missiles. While Mark III is a reality and easily achievable, Mark X is a challenge. Nothing would have changed significantly on the battlefield in a legacy scenario if a target at 500 kilometers was addressed in 10 minutes instead of 3 minutes. However, when a quick autonomous decision-making capability is available, 7 minutes may seem like a long time. Furthermore, the maneuverability of difficult to detect air-breathing hypersonic cruise missile in the atmosphere have completely changed the dynamics of threat apart from the shock and awe they generate. <coughs> There will be hypersonic UAVs tomorrow. You will need to take quick decisions and the choice is not going to be between heads and tails. It is going to be one option amongst 100 maybe. You can't play gamble either. You need assistance to take not only quick but credible decisions. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are emerging as powerful tools for making more timely and credible decisions. For example, AI ML algorithms can provide real-time information and recommendations to pilots and commanders, allowing them to make informed decisions in fast-paced and dynamic situations. These algorithms can aid in planning of complex missions by taking into account factors such as aircraft and weapon capability, enemy threats, weather, fuel consumption, and thus suggesting most suitable launch or recovery bases. Drones outfitted with AI ML algorithms can fly and navigate autonomously with no human, inter, uh, human intervention required. They are capable of directing, detecting and identifying potential targets, analyzing data and making decisions on their own. 
Now, while the term algorithm frequently appears in AI application, it is not the most complex aspect of AI architecture. Algorithms are based on set of mathematics, the majority of which is centuries old. The most complicated aspect is the data that drives it. How does artificial intelligence work? Before that, how do humans make decisions? We'll say they are trained to do it. Commanders are trained through their experience gained over time. What is training for AI like? The training for AI is data, a large amount of data from various disciplines. And let me illustrate this with a simple example. Assume if a computer was asked to choose between two watches, one of which is permanently stopped and the other loses one second per day, if it only had simple computing power and no intelligence, it would recommend going with the one that is permanently stopped because it gives you correct time twice a day, whereas the other gives you correct time once in 236 years. Now, if you want this computer to come up with a reasonable solution, it will undoubtedly require a lot more information about how time management works in real life. Fearing the lack of data that would drive AI, an expert committee under the UN in a meeting in September 20 argued for a strict control and partial ban on autonomous weapons. It said that autonomous weapons posed serious risk to global security. The Secretary General himself tweeted, and I quote, autonomous machines with the power and discretion to select targets and take lives without human involvement are politically unacceptable, morally repugnant, and should be prohibited by international law." Unquote. And why did the committee arrive at this conclusion? It was argued that even the best artificial intelligence isn't well suited to, dis uh, to distinguish farmers from soldiers and may be trained only on laboratory data that is poor substitute for real battlefields. A little over two years later, the United States is developing a self-flying F-16 under the Venom program in order to refine an AI engine capable of flying a whole range of current and future aircraft. The technology has matured since then. Even then, the practitioners will have to wargame numerous simulations before trusting it in the battlefield. AI tools will still go by the rules, and in battlefield, there are no rules. All of the applications of AI mentioned above will require a huge amount of data on aircraft, weapons, missiles, radars, terrain, weather, and so on. And the challenge is that they will not only require data, but they will also require real-time updates and super-fast processing of this huge data. And how will that be accomplished? That is where quantum technology will come into play. Quantum computing has the potential to improve air warfare by allowing for faster and more accurate data processing and analysis, which in turn is required for faster decision-making. Researchers in quantum technology manipulate the properties of quantum particles such as electrons and photons to develop new technologies that provide faster computing speeds, more secure communication, and more precise sensing and imaging. So, quantum technology is more than just one discipline. It includes quantum sensing, quantum imaging, quantum computing, and quantum timing. A stealth aircraft, for example, can be detected using a quantum sensing application. Stealth technology employs materials that absorb or reflect radar signals, rendering aircraft radar invisible. However, quantum sensors could be used to detect subtle changes in the environment caused by the aircraft presence, such as changes in gravitational or magnetic fields. This could allow for the detection of stealth aircraft or even incoming missile without the use of radar. In the same breath, Quantum imaging can improve an aircraft's stealth capability by employing a technique known as quantum illumination. For fear of being detected by the adversary, the aircraft kept their radar turned off or on silence as we know it. Two entangled photons are used in quantum illumination, one to illuminate the target and the other as a reference. The target's reflected photons are then compared to the reference photon and the resulting signal can be used to generate an image of the target. This process is extremely sensitive along for much lower levels of illumination to be used, reducing the illuminating aircraft's signature, thus increasing its stealth capability. Traditional inertial navigation systems suffer from gyro drift and must be updated by GPS. Quantum sensors could be used to improve aircraft navigation. For example, gyroscopes based on quantum sensors could provide more accurate information about an aircraft's orientation, 
which is critical when flying in bad weather or in GPS denied environment. Unlike traditional communication channels, which can be intercepted and hacked, quantum communication based on quantum mechanics principles makes communications impossible to intercept or evade drop on. An atomic clock, for example, has an accuracy of one second in a million years. Quantum timing is even more precise, implying more precise information on satellite's position and more precise coordinates for targeting. It is important to note, however, that quantum technologies are still in their early stage of development with many technical and practical challenges to overcome before they can be deployed in operational contexts. Quantum sensing devices, for example, can be large and heavy, requiring a lot of space, weight and power. Thermal noise causes photons to be disturbed. Now the material with which they interact must be cooled down to 10 degrees Kelvin which necessitates the use of large refrigerators. As a result, this technology is currently being tested on ships but will eventually make its way into aircraft. Quantum communication is based on fragile quantum states that can be easily disrupted or destroyed by outside noise or interference. Also, the photons used for transmission gradually lose energy and weaken over longer distances needing amplifiers. Now, this can make establishing long distance quantum networks difficult. Despite these challenges, with increase in autonomous operations in every domain and space becoming the new frontier of warfare, they are going to be upscaled sooner than we probably think. Now, you may have developed any amount of capability in space, air or ground, but you are vulnerable if you do not protect the cyber that enables that capability. Almost everything has some kind of cyber application. Cyber warfare has emerged as a major concern for modern uh, militaries. All the information for war fighting and consequent strategy is in the form of data. Hackers have the ability to infiltrate computer systems and disrupt military operations, steal sensitive information and launch coordinated cyber attacks. Somehow, the cyber domain in war fighting has evolved in such a way that the threat must be addressed before the capability, similar to how you must plug leaks before filling up a pool. While cyber attacks require a high degree of understanding of the systems being targeted, they do not necessarily require significant resources to conduct. The barrier to entry is relatively low and cyber attacks can be contracted out to private groups or individuals. <coughs> cyber operations in terms of espionage and countermeasures is just one part. Cyber domain has thrown different kind of challenges. For example, it has changed the very definition of sovereignty. Halfway across the global, Apple introduces some privacy norms and it becomes difficult to implement law and order in India. Will cyber warrior be considered a combatant and targeted? Take the example of SpaceX Starlink terminals being termed as legitimate targets when they started extrapolating the broadband information to derive coordinates. The issue is that things will fundamentally change. They will no longer function as they do now. Consider this. You have two identities, physical identity and digital identity. As of now, your physical identity is your primary identity and digital is secondary. As long as someone recognizes you, you can still walk through air headquarters without biometrics. So even if someone hacks your biometrics or tempers with your Aadhaar data, the world will not end. As technology becomes more embedded, your digital identity will become your primary identity. You will be unable to function without it. Now, if your digital identity is compromised, not only you are compromised like in a banking fraud, but the bigger issue is that you are no one. You will be barred out of participating in any operations or any decision making chain. No one is going to take orders on phone. They will all be digital and you, without the digital access, are non-functional. I would call it a digital murder. As a result, you will need to protect your digital identity in the same way as you protect your physical self. War fighting heavily relies on computer networks, communications and data transfer. Any intrusion or disruption attack or even mere skepticism of it can throw operations out of gear. You require internet resilience. The network's supply chain therefore must be given special consideration. The United States Army has requested SBUMs, that is Software Bill of Materials, for its network, the list of components and that comprise an application or a system allowing evaluation of a piece of software or an entire system's origins, 
vulnerability and risks. Now, if new technology is a challenge, incorporating new technology is even a bigger challenge. The most difficult challenge of incorporating new technology, technology is not its complexity. Rather, the most formidable adversity of technology is reality, the real people. It can be difficult to understand how an AI system arrived at a specific decision or recommendation, especially if it contradicts, contradicts your gut feeling, making it difficult to trust the system. I believe that the integrity of an AI's decision making is directly proportional to the quantum and integrity of data. Because AI training is data, you can be confident in its output if you are confident in its training. The same goes for every bit of technology. Finally, let's see where does India stand on these technology and what can do in the near and long term. Since we are talking of India's progress, I may overshoot the time a bit. Oh, I mean, there is a lot happening. India successfully tested the scramjet powered hypersonic technology demonstrator vehicle for the first time in September 20, which can travel at Mach 6 and is recognized as a significant step towards India's pursuit of hypersonic weapons. On January 27 this year, the third test was conducted. There are few details available, but the technology is expected to mature within the next five to six years. At NSA level meet on the sidelines of SEO, India and Russia discussed the possibility of the joint development of hypersonic version of BrahMos, to be called BrahMos 2. However, the hypersonic technology is time consuming and costly. For instance, USA itself has demanded $11 billion in the 2024 budget to work on its hypersonic attack cruise missile program. Realizing the importance of cybersecurity, India raised Defense Cyber Agency that must be looking into the aspects of cybersecurity. While all services are vulnerable to cyber attacks, the IAF is more so due to the nature of its operations. It has done well with AFNET, subjecting its software and hardware to rigorous VAPT, that is vulnerability assessment penetration testing, but the infrastructure requires attention. Insufficient cable depth in civil areas resulting in frequent cuts and lack of physical redundancy between two cables where both cables run next to each other are causes for concern. It is believed that the entire layout is being revamped to address these specific issues. Caution is advised till then. India is home to IT industry worth $250 billion with 20% IT professionals in the world being Indians. We must develop our own operating system. China has intensified efforts to replace Windows and Mac by its own operating system, Kylan. It was introduced in 2011, though not very popular in civil, but is widely used in military and government computers. Recently, a homegrown operating system has been developed by a private limited company incubated by IIT Madras, Pravartak Technologies Foundation, which is funded by Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. It is called Bharos, presumably for Bharat operating system. I feel they could have added an A for Atam Nirbar at the end to call it Bharosa, a nice and apt Indian name. Well, it's a step in the right direction and needs to be matured fast if you are looking for meaningful cyber security. India is working in two aspects of quantum technology, quantum safe algorithms as well as quantum key distribution. According to my understanding, QSA are not algorithms that run on quantum technology but rather classic algorithms that have been made breach safe using quantum technology. To amplify the degree of security provided, if it took a professional three hours to breach in a standard algorithm, QSA will take him 15 days to affect the same level of breach. Work is being done on QKD, that is quantum key distribution, which detect, de, uh, detects any intrusion and issues an alarm. However, the range is only about 100 to 120 kilometers. The incorporation of AIML functions in UAS and counter US technology is one area where India can quickly make significant progress. India is developing reconnaissance and armed UAVs as well as anti-drone systems. Innovations in the US domain deliver immediate results. Ukraine created fins for grenades using 3D printers that were then launched from commercial drones to a great effect. According to the emerging threat scenario, India should seriously focus more on counter drone systems. Drones are used by non-state actors and pose an ongoing threat. There are numerous reports of drone sightings near military installations, which are sometimes false alarms. This can lead to a cry wolf situation in which one drone may succeed to enter undetected. We must achieve autonomy in the detection and neutralization of drones. 
One such solution is an autonomous drone catcher. The radar detects the drone and activates the drone catcher, which takes off in seconds to physically capture the rogue drone. The radar includes an AIML function that distinguish, distinguishes between birds, helicopters, planes, and drones. The drone catcher has its own EO device, even a radar on board in some cases, to locate the intruder. Additionally, activation of drone catcher would indirectly announce the threat and alert the operators who can then activate other forms of defense such as RF, GPS jamming or lasers depending on what is available. We inducted UAVs only after Cargill in a hurry even though they had been on the scene for decades. After the gaps in intelligence were exposed, we can afford to be abreast if not ahead in the counter US technology at least. To summarize, technology alone may not win the war but you cannot ignore it. Like they say money cannot buy happiness but it's better to cry in a BMW than on a bicycle. <laughs> so you must have technology. Technology is expensive and staying ahead of the curve is even more so. The government may not be able to do so alone. It will almost certainly require private participation. The only way forward is to encourage R&D in the private sector by forging meaningful public-private partnerships through refined acquisition processes. Thank you very much, Jack.